This is an RNZ podcast. One thing that frustrates me making this show is the stuff we have to leave out. I think you all realise that you can't actually compress any person's life down into 20 or 30 minutes without missing out lots of important things. But with these black sheep we talk about in the show... Some of them have such bizarre, extraordinary life stories that sometimes the things we leave out would be the single biggest event in any normal person's life. Take Thomas Russell. We did a show about him in our first series. Go back and have a listen if you haven't already because it might give you some context for today's show. So Thomas was the most famous businessman of his time in New Zealand, an Auckland lawyer, property speculator who founded New Zealand's first bank, first insurance company, served as defence minister, did all kinds of dodgy business deals and was heavily involved in pushing for the invasion of Māori land in the Waikato in the 1860s. With a life as busy as that, Maybe it's not surprising that we didn't have time to mention that one time a famous arsonist tried to murder him and his entire family. So let's make up for that in this episode of Black Sheep and meet that arsonist. We'll pick up the story at Thomas Russell's family home at Par Farm just outside Auckland where the suburb of Onehanga is today. It's just after midnight, January 22nd, 1871. Thomas Russell isn't at home. He's in the city on business. Inside it is his wife, Emmeline, and their seven children. Emmeline wakes up to the sound of footsteps on the veranda. I'll let the New Zealand Herald pick up the narrative. Mrs Russell, hearing the footsteps, at once called out to her son, a lad sleeping in the next room, that there was some person about... The son got out of his bed and went to the window. The windows of the house are glass, opening out onto the veranda in the French style. He drew aside the curtain and put his face close to the glass to look for the intruder. As he did so, he saw the face of a man peering in. In that instant, as their eyes made contact, the man outside in the dark raised a revolver and fired. The bullet passed just above the boy's head, although the New Zealand Herald noted darkly that Had he been somewhat taller, as tall, for instance, as his father, he must inevitably have been shot. The man in the dark went to the next window, Emmeline's room. Both bullets miss, but one was so close that it went through the pillow she was sleeping on. And generally speaking, he goes round the house, firing into a number of its many windows. Over the sound of gunfire and splintering glass, the family can clearly hear the gunman outside screaming Thomas Russell's name. Thomas Russell! Come on, Russell! Come on, Russell! Tommy! Thomas Russell! And then... After eight shots, silence. The gunman vanished into the night without a trace. The police investigate but cannot find any evidence for who's done it. Two days later, a handwritten note was shoved under the door of Thomas Russell's Auckland Law Office. First and last intimation. Accumulating wealth at expense of and by defrauding the humbler classes. Caledonian book closing. Making bad use of wealth and position. Wife haughty and proud to those she ought to help. International. Yourself. Wife. Family. Death. Poison. Shooting. Stabbing. Property. Fire. Servants who do not leave you after notice shall share as their masters. Finale. Within two years. Torture. At every opportunity. The bit of that note which mentioned the Caledonian book closing will be important later. But for now, let's stick with the Russell family, who must have been totally terrified by this whole saga. And it's not over. The family are jolted awake a few nights later by another disturbance. This time, they look outside to see two haystacks burning. Those fires, together with the bizarre death threat, 
with the signature of a criminal who'd been terrorising Auckland for the last year. This man had burned down four major buildings and sent messages threatening to assassinate major figures in the city. Enormous rewards were offered for his capture, but every attempt to identify him failed. His name was Cyrus Haley. Someone's writing letters Someone's making threats Someone says he's gonna kill five men And light more fires yet Out at Russell's mansion A pistol has been fired Cyrus Haley, he's been caught The jury has retired What makes a man go crazy? What makes a man go bad? What makes a man lose everything? Everything he had A twisted mind and a cold black heart Surely headed down Though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death It's not heaven that he's bound He was a, a, a slight man, not, not tall, not, not, not big built, bearded, quite nice looking in his photographs, and uh, of a quiet, serious, sincere sort of demeanour. So people were impressed by him. He sort of seemed like a sort of stereotypical English gentleman, I guess. Pretty much. Yeah. The last guy you would expect to be involved in major wacky criminal enterprises. This is historian Mark Darby, who looked into Cyrus Haley's story while he was researching a book about Mount Eden Prison. It's actually quite difficult to tell the story of Cyrus's early life. All we have to go on are some newspaper articles written after he was jailed, and they probably had a bit of a vested interest in painting him in as negative a light as possible. Anyway, Cyrus Haley was born in Leeds to a comfortably middle-class family in 1832. He trained as an engineer and joined the British Army's elite Corps of Royal Engineers. He was deployed to India, which is where he had his first brush with crime. It seems as though he identified that one of his superior officers had been involved in a theft of some kind, and he appears to have blackmailed the guy until eventually both the theft and the blackmail were uncovered. And... Haley was convicted at a court-martial and sent back to Britain to serve his time. And, I mean, he served quite a long time, so it must have been quite treated as quite a serious matter. It was clearly a very serious offence. That's one reason why he was sent back from India. He was seen as too dangerous a criminal to be held in the Indian jails, and so he was sent to Portland Prison, military prison in Britain, initially serving a six-year sentence, although he didn't serve anything like that time in the end. And he ends up going back to India a few years later. Yes, as soon as he served his time, I think he returned to India. He he had been cashiered out of the army. He couldn't return to uh, his military career. But he worked as an engineer on the Indian Railways, which was a huge business um, involving many different railway companies. And he worked for one of those as an engineer, did very well, surprisingly well. He, uh, he rose through the ranks, he was highly regarded, made good money, and returned to Britain after a few years as a man of means, really. I mean, it shows, uh, I guess, aside from anything else, that he wasn't, a, he wasn't a dumb guy. No one who knew him seems to have suggested that he was a dumb guy. In fact, he impressed the people that he met on first acquaintance. And people were surprised, often astonished, when they actually found out his, his background, the fact that he did have all this shady stuff uh, behind him. And Cyrus Haley gets involved in more shady stuff when he returns to the UK from India in the mid-1860s. He seems to have had a facility for mucking up every opportunity that came his way. He and his father formed a coal company in the region around Leeds where where he was born, they named it with a name very similar to that of an existing, much larger, well-established coal company, clearly with the intention of trading on that other company's name. The older company uh, resented this, sued them, won, won very extensive damages. And Haley appears to have uh, 
tried to exact some sort of retribution against the head of that older company. It's not exactly clear what Cyrus did in retribution to the owner of this coal company that sued him, but some newspaper reports suggested it involved a gun. He seems to have left Britain with his family soon after that, probably to escape the bad reputation that he created. In September 1870, a 28-year-old Cyrus Haley, together with his wife and two children, arrived in Auckland. Which was absolutely exploding with um, borrowed money, new investment, Fortunes were being made uh, and lost almost all the time. It must have been a very exciting time. It must have given him the opportunity that a capable, resourceful, daring fellow like himself could become a leading figure, not just in the city but in the whole country, and that appears to have been his intention. Part of how Cyrus hoped to make his mark on the city was through the art scene, which was flourishing at the time. His wife, Emily Haley, was a professional singer and the two of them organised a big show at the music hall to show off her talents under her stage name of Madame Hull. All of the movers and shakers in town were talking about it. The Duke of Edinburgh was visiting Auckland at the time and acted as the patron of the show alongside the Governor of New Zealand. The Auckland Star wrote this the day before the concert was held. Judging from the programme and the character of the performers, we anticipate one of the most attractive and successful concerts that can be desired. This is the first of a series of concerts to be given by Madame Howe, and if her performances warrant such critiques as have accompanied her performances elsewhere, we predict for this lady a brilliant success in Auckland. But the day after that performance, it was a different story. The concert is a disaster. The reviews are scathing. It seems as though Mrs Haley had a problem with drink and that she wasn't entirely sober and missed her notes. The uh, audiences were poor and the second concert is cancelled. So their dreams of making a big splash with the, on the Auckland cultural scene are dashed almost straight away. It's a, uh, a big blow for their, their hopes for their, for their new country, I think. This is where the trouble starts. About a month later, on the 24th of January, the residents of Auckland woke to the smell of smoke and found articles like this one headlining the newspapers. At half past two o'clock this morning, the ringing of fire bells and the rise of volumes of smoke announced an outbreak of fire in the vicinity of the wharf. A fire appears to have broken out in the hold of the ship, City of Auckland. At the time of our going to press, the crew were hauling her off from the wharf with the intention, we were given to understand, of scuttling her in case of emergency. The city of Auckland was beloved by the locals, many of whom had actually sailed on it when they first came to New Zealand as immigrants. At the time it went up in flames, it was full up with 800 tonnes of cargo for export. A few days later, there was an even bigger blaze. Destructive fire. Archard and Brown's kerosene store destroyed by supposed incendiarism. The store was built of corrugated iron and at the time of the fire was occupied by 1,200 cases of kerosene, each case containing eight gallons. That's about 44,000 litres in total, just in case you were wondering. Of course, no effort was made to stay the progress of the flames. The only thing to do was to allow them to burn themselves out. As may be easily imagined, it gave out intense flame and heat and belched forth huge volumes of thick black smoke which rolled away inland. And unlike the burning of the city of Auckland, there's immediate suspicion that the fire at the kerosene store was deliberately lit. We greatly fear this fire was the work of an incendiary. Mr Archard states that when he came down, the first thing he noticed was that one of the sheets of corrugated iron had been forced open, and he feels convinced that some person must have entered this aperture and willfully set the kerosene on fire. A few days later, there's a third inferno this time at the music hall where Cyrus's wife gave her disastrous performance. About ten minutes to three o'clock this morning, Mr McComish, a bandmaster who kept charge of the music hall, was awakened by a suffocating smoke. On getting up, he observed the lean-to of the music hall on fire. The fire had obtained a firm hold of it and was breaking through the side door leading into the hall. He gave the alarm and proceeded to save his family. All his property, with the exception of a small box, was consumed. Later, it was discovered that the fire bell next to the music hall had been sabotaged so that people couldn't raise the alarm quickly. This fire's in Auckland 
city The culprit can't be found The coral hall that once stood tall Burned down to the ground A ship out in the harbour Now she's just a shell The music hall, the kerosene store well Burned down as well It's clearly arson, and there are all sorts of rumours flying around the city as to who might be responsible. Haley, I'm sure, is asked for his opinion, and uh, as a, a you know man about town, he's saying, "Oh, I think it might be this. I think it might be that." No one, no one could possibly suspect that it was him who'd done it. And one of the leading candidates is that it might be international communism. Yes, the uh, the overseas press are full of reports of something called the Communist International. No one really knows too much about it, but it is this scary new political force that has arisen in Europe and people suspect it of carrying out acts of sabotage, um, devastating attacks on uh, existing commercial institutions in many countries and it's suspected that its tentacles could reach as far as New Zealand and, th- and that it may be responsible for these fires. To give a bit more background, the Communist International was an organisation formed in 1864 to unite communist and anarchist groups from all around the world and boasted membership in the millions. The vast majority of those people were totally peaceful, but there were some hardcore radicals. Later on in the 1800s, anarchist bombings, burnings and assassinations would become a very big deal in the United States and Europe. And fears that communists or anarchists could be behind the fires in Auckland were only heightened by a handwritten letter which was sent to the Southern Cross newspaper claiming responsibility for the fires. It's long and rambling, but it gave accurate details of how the fires were started, and then said this. There will be no more fires at present from our party. When we commence again, we shall tell you, and shall number them as we go on. We vow to destroy a hundred thousand pounds worth of property, and take five of the lives of the most obnoxious persons. We are a clan vowing vengeance and determined to have by any or some means what we have not been able to get by fair means. The letter went on to explain more explicitly what was motivating the arson, claiming that tradesmen and new arrivals to Auckland were pushed aside while the authorities handed out powerful positions and sweetheart deals to old chums and favourites. It finished with this warning. Fortunately for the poor persons who have been gulled out here, you all have easily assailable points. Wooden houses and circumstances favouring assassination. 1871 will be a sad year for Auckland. A £500 reward was offered, but the police had no luck tracking down the sender of that letter. Haley was absolutely untouched by uh, any suspicion uh, from these fires in early 1871, and he continued to try and build his reputation as a businessman in the fairly heated Auckland world of commerce. Uh, he bought and sold shares in, in, in the gold mines, in the gold Russian Thames, but he also developed his own business in Auckland City. He leased a part of a prominent new building, the New Zealand Insurance Company headquarters in in Queen Street. He leased a floor of that building and in there he established a reading room where the gentlemen of the town would meet and read the latest press, the newspapers from around the country and overseas, smoke their cigars, talk about what was happening um, in, in the worlds of politics and business. And he also began to set up a very large and luxurious restaurant It was said to be the finest establishment of its kind in Australasia. Uh, He was on the point of opening the restaurant, and he had already invited the press in to look around and write up admiring stories about it when a fire broke out in that part of the NZI headquarters. So this fire raged through the the floor of the building that that Haley leased. Mm. The rather primitive local fire brigade was unable to put it out and it was pretty much completely gutted. 
both of his businesses, the reading room and the restaurant, were, were destroyed by fire. So now there's been a fourth major fire in Auckland in a single year, and it's not the last. A choral hall was built on the site of the music hall, and again, that hadn't long been opened when again it went up in smoke and was destroyed. The, the choral hall that's there today is a replacement for that building. Mm. So this is yet another in the string of high-profile, devastating fires in Auckland at that time, and it will have simply added to the anxiety, to the rumours, to the paranoia that was uh, building around the city at that point. And yet, in spite of all the public attention, nobody seems to have noticed that there was one thing connecting all of the fires. Every location where a blaze was lit had some kind of link to Thomas Russell. The most obvious was the fire at Cyrus Haley's reading room and restaurant, which, as Mark Darby mentioned, was in the same building as the New Zealand Insurance Company's headquarters. NZI was founded and run by Russell, and it had insured both the City of Auckland sailing ship and the kerosene store. Russell was also a major patron of the music hall and was probably involved in rebuilding the new choral hall before it too was burned down. Nobody made the link between uh, these fires and Russell at that point. He was so embedded. He, he had so many uh, he had fingers and so many pies in the Auckland commercial, cultural, social world that uh, it could have been entirely coincidental that these fires all had some connection with him and nobody seems to have suggested that, that he was in any way, um, <laughs> that these fires were linked to him at that point. It wasn't until January 1872 that anyone realised the fires might be personally targeting Russell. That's where we started this episode, with the mysterious man in the dark shooting up Russell's house, the delivery of a threatening note to his workplace, and finally, the burning haystacks on his farm. This is the point in the story where Cyrus was finally unmasked. When the burning haystacks were spotted, some of Russell's servants raced into Auckland City to raise the alarm. The chief of police, Inspector Brougham, put together a squad of officers, and they fanned out between Onihunga and Auckland, hoping to intercept the criminal on his way back from the scene of the crime. And sure enough, it's Brougham himself who spots a slightly built figure making his way around uh, the area of Mount Eden. The shadowy figure on the road turns and runs. Inspector Brougham gets off his horse and sprints after him. According to the Southern Cross, it was quite a dramatic chase. The man, finding himself pursued, increased his speed and for a time was lost to sight. Fortunately, Mr Brougham is remarkably swift of foot, there being, with the exception of professional pedestrians, few to equal him in speed in this colony. In the pursuit, Mr Brougham had to leap a massive stone wall, cross through an orchard and again over a hawthorn fence, following up the chase over some very rough ground, across ditches and through thick scrub. The man was still considerably ahead and also proved a swift runner, yet the pace of Mr Brougham told at last, and every minute the distance between the two lessened. Finally the shadowy figure realised he couldn't escape. He turned and raised a revolver, pointing it directly at Inspector Brougham. But before he can fire, he trips and falls, and Brougham, who is unarmed himself, leaps upon him and subdues him. A very brave action for a, a man to do against somebody whom he knows is armed and has probably recently... Uh, been firing his, his, his gun wildly. The only reason Inspector Brougham wasn't shot is that while that shadowy figure was trying to pull the gun out of his pocket, the ammo cylinder had caught and fallen off his gun. Inspector Brougham fights desperately, beating the man over the head with the butt of his riding crop. He subdues the man, and by the moonlight, he recognises him. As Haley, he recognises him as a well-known Auckland figure, somebody whom he has met socially. It must have. It must have just been such an insane moment. It must have been. He he would clearly have been astonished. Haley freely admits his guilt, and he is marched off to the uh, station, bleeding because he's been badly beaten up in the course of being arrested. 
While Cyrus Haley is being treated by the prison doctor, he essentially confesses, claiming that he's the leader of a group of 50 men who are behind the burnings in Auckland, although he later admitted that he acted alone. He's charged and committed for trial. Arson, attempted murder, these are crimes for which he could expect to be hanged. He pleads not guilty, and as you say, the evidence against him is overwhelming. The police have searched his house, and in that house they have found guns that match the ones that were fired at Russell's house. They've discovered the materials that were used to set fire to the kerosene store, so he's charged with that arson. They're unable to find evidence to link him to the other fires, including the destruction of his own restaurant. But uh, that one arson alone is itself a very serious offence, and as is sending the threatening letter, which they're able to prove he sent. And the way they're able to prove that letter (laughs) that was sent by him is pretty spectacular. It's uh, absurd, absurd. Um, The letter is written on the back of a larger sheet of paper with other writing on it, That larger sheet is torn in half. He writes the note on one half and slips it under the door. The other matching half of that sheet is discovered in his house when the police search it. Uh, He certainly hasn't made any effort at all to cover his tracks or to um, conceal his involvement in these crimes, which makes you think either that he couldn't imagine ever being caught or that somehow he expected to be caught and was prepared to be. It's really hard to know now which of the two it was. What makes a man go crazy? What makes a man go bad? What makes a man lose everything? Everything he had? A twisted mind and a cold black heart Surely headed down Though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death It's not heaven that he found There's another even bigger question which goes unanswered at Cyrus Haley's trial. Why did Cyrus have a vendetta against Thomas Russell? There are three possible explanations. The first is that Cyrus was, well, insane. Some of the things he said to the police doctor and to other uh, police uh, officers were regarded as the ramblings of a deranged man. Mm. I think that uh, Russell himself perhaps felt that he was dealing with a lunatic, but the jury considered him sane. The second explanation is that Cyrus was a genuine communist or anarchist revolutionary, and he targeted Russell because he was a prominent capitalist and member of the ruling class. Remember that the letter Cyrus sent to Russell's workplace opened with an accusation that he was accumulating wealth at the expense of and by defrauding the humbler classes, which seems like the kind of thing a radical communist might say. Whether... Haley is sincere in holding these views or whether he is trying to cover his tracks by implicating members of the Communist International, it's hard to tell at this historical distance. I don't myself believe for a moment that he did subscribe to anti-capitalist views, that he was in any way a member or even a, a, a distant supporter of the Communist International simply because... He was a capitalist himself. (laughs) Well, yeah. From the very moment he arrived in New Zealand, he did everything possible to establish himself in the uh, commercial elite of Auckland. Which leaves one last possibility, that Cyrus wanted personal revenge on Russell for something. There's a potential hint of this in the note Cyrus slipped under the door. It referred to something called the Caledonian book closing, which you might remember from the start of this podcast. The Caledonian gold mine in Thames was owned by Russell and made an enormous amount of money, but that came to an abrupt end in 1871 when Russell decided to close the books. That is, they stopped putting out information about the mine's share price. This caused a huge downturn in the value of Caledonian shares, which was really bad news for Cyrus Haley. Throughout that year, he was speculating on quite a large scale 
in, in gold mining shares, and particularly shares in the Caledonian mine, which is the one that Russell owned, the biggest of the mines in Thames. He, uh, he did suffer a big setback. He bought shares pretty much uh, at their peak price, around £100 each, and they dropped soon after that to almost £20. So they dropped by 80%. This means that he must have lost a fortune. He later claimed to have lost £3,000, an enormous amount of money at that time. So maybe Cyrus blamed Russell for that financial loss, but it's hard to buy that that's all there was to it, given Cyrus's family was still living in a fancy house with servants. The tone of the letters sent to the paper and to Russell's work read like someone who was furious, not just at Russell, but at what Russell represented to Cyrus Haley, the financial and social elite of Auckland. Perhaps that fury was first triggered by the disastrous concert his wife gave at the music hall just a few months after their arrival in New Zealand. My best guess is that he was a victim of the social pressure to be successful, to be financially successful, to cut a dash in society in that time. He he wanted to become part of the upper stratum of Auckland society and he failed in every regard. And uh, I think that this caused him to develop an absolute fixation against the one man in particular that he saw as responsible for his failure, uh, uh, that he identified Thomas Russell in particular as the root cause of his devastating fall from grace and was determined to avenge himself on him. And he did this in the most bizarre and ultimately, for him, disastrous way. But it's weird because Russell doesn't seem to have ever deliberately done anything to hurt Cyrus. Yes, that's true. I don't think Russell was even very much aware of Haley as an individual at that time. It's it seems possible to me that perhaps Haley admired Russell, that he wished to emulate him, that this grand, self-made man, who. Uh, really dominated the the world of Auckland commerce at that time. It's a, it's a speculation, but a reasonable one, that he saw himself as, as emulating Russell's success and eventually um, becoming a figure of a similar st- as a status. He totally failed to do this, and I think this has caused him to blame Russell and to then set out to, to drag him down. Before the trial was over, Cyrus Haley changed his plea from not guilty to guilty. He was sentenced to three life sentences. He was actually one of just seven prisoners considered so dangerous they needed to be moved from the wooden jail in Auckland to the more secure stone prison which had been built in Dunedin. Cyrus's wife, Emily Haley, went to the United Kingdom with their two children when he was sentenced, but three years later, she brought the family back to New Zealand and went to live in Dunedin. It does appear, though, that her drinking had deteriorated uh, in that time and that she was not really capable of looking after her children. While Haley was in prison in Dunedin, her children were removed from her care and placed in an industrial school in Dunedin, which was a, a forerunner of a Borstal, a place where... Uh, children convicted of offences or um, of not being able to be properly supported were held. As the name Industrial School implies, they were expected to uh, work for their keep and uh, to eventually be trained in sort of manual occupations and then jobs would be found for them and they'd be sent out as sort of servants or labourers. It was certainly a huge blow to the pride of somebody like Haley, who saw himself as a gentleman or a a would-be gentleman, to have his children housed in an institution along with uh, the children of the criminal element and the the poorest classes, yeah. Cyrus, you were guilty of shooting with intent. They threw a man to prison to Dunedin. He was sent His family, they followed him But he was in for life They took away his children The drinking took his wife Whatever you might think of Cyrus Haley, I can't help but see what happened to his kids as a tragedy. Cyrus snapped. He threatened to kill the prison chaplain who was involved in the decision to send his kids to the industrial school and it seems he decided to rescue them at any cost. 
On October 4th, 1875, he took one last look at the photo of his children, put it in his jacket pocket, and waited for his moment to escape. Cyrus couldn't take it He couldn't stay in chains He tried to run, tried to get away But God had other plans At this point, he has been um, sentenced to serve with a hard labour gang. They're working under the command of of an armed warder outside the prison, building streets, hacking into the, the, the hillside, and Haley he manages to conceal himself from the guard long enough to slip out of his, of his prison trousers, takes them off and makes a run for it in his underwear uh, with, his, with his jacket on, no, no pants. Makes a break for it. The guard calls upon him to stop and he doesn't. Keeps running. A, a series of guards call out to him to stop or threaten to shoot. He doesn't. He gets almost as far as the octagon. Cyrus tasted freedom with the coal yard just ahead. He thought that he could make it, but the water he saw red. First he fired a warning shot, the second just missed his head. He raised his rifle once again. Cyrus, he lay dead. And he's killed. So his career in New Zealand lasts only about five years, is it? Less, less than six years from arrival to his, his death in Dunedin. What makes a man go crazy? What makes a man go bad? What makes a man lose everything? Everything he had. A twisted mind and a cold black heart. Surely headed down Though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death It's not heaven that he found Special thanks to Mark Darby. Stay tuned for a sneak peek at next week's Black Sheep. But first, this is the bit in the podcast where I tell you to subscribe, which can be done in a variety of fun and exciting ways. You could use Apple Podcasts or Stitcher or Radio Public. You could also use RNZ's excellent app. And on that app, as you might expect, you can find other great RNZ content. For the parents listening, I'm going to recommend It Takes a Village, which is a series of really amazing interviews by my old boss, Catherine Ryan, from the 9 to Noon program with various parenting experts. Actually, to be honest, I think it makes really good listening even if you're not a parent. Anyway, next week on Black Sheep, the story of a 17-year-old who nearly shot the Queen. No smoking gun, but a gun with a spent cartridge. People that heard the bullet and other people suggesting there was political interference, including the lawyer, the former cop, and the friend. It was certainly downplayed. I mean, a gun was certainly fired at the time she got out of the vehicle. Bullet was never recovered. Ballistics were never done on the weapon. Uh, We don't even know where that weapon was. We haven't got photographs of the weapon. Um, Some basic police work just seemingly wasn't done. Black Sheep is written and presented by me, William Ray. The executive producer is Tim Watkin and our sound engineer is William Saunders. Hi, icons. It's Danny Pellegrino from the pop culture podcast, Everything Iconic, and I love Nordstrom. No place better to shop, particularly during the holiday season, because they have everything. They have holiday decor at Nordstrom. They have cozy cardigans from Barefoot Dreams, my fave. They have cold weather attire, party attire, plus free shipping and free returns, free store pickup. You can also purchase a recycled fabric gift bag so your item arrives festive and wrapped. So check out Nordstrom this holiday season, a one-stop shop. You can explore more at Nordstrom in-store or online at Nordstrom.com.